Uh, our uh, next speaker is Stephen Karp from uh, La Cim University du Quebec in Montreal. Uh, he will speak about uh, regularity theorem for totally non-negative flag varieties. Okay. Um, thank you, Ellie, and uh, thanks everyone uh, for attending my talk. And um, I'd also like to thank the program committee and the organizers uh, for putting on this year's conference. So uh, today uh, I'll be speaking about a joint work with uh, Pavel Galashin and Thomas Lamb on the topology of totally non-negative flag varieties. And uh, I'd like to try to uh, motivate our result uh, via an analogy um, with uh, this space, uh, the permutahedron. So uh, this is a polytope. Um, whose vertices are all permutations uh, of the vector 1, 2, 3, up to n. So its vertices correspond to elements of the symmetric group Sn. And um, there's also a nice description of its edges. Uh, its edges are just given by taking a vertex and then switching uh, to consecutive numbers i and i plus 1. And uh, these are actually the uh, Kupper relations uh, in a poset uh, called the um, weak uh, Bruja order on the symmetric group. Okay, so uh, here's the uh, picture in one dimension less uh, for n equals three. So here we have um, the uh, Hasse diagram of the weak Bruja order on the symmetric group. And here we have the permutahedron, uh, which I'm suggesting we think of as a geometric realization of this poset in the sense that the vertices and edges over here correspond to the vertices and edges in this Hasse diagram. Now there's a, a Another nice poset structure on the symmetric group, uh, which is called the strong Bruja order. And uh, we could ask, can we do the same thing? Find a geometric realization of this poset. And um, in this case, here's what you can do. So uh, we have these um, two crossing edges in the front. So you can imagine this picture is uh, drawn in three dimensions. And what we're gonna do is take these uh, crossing edges and pull them apart so that they travel on opposite sides of the surface of a sphere. And then we'll get a picture that looks like this. Uh, and we could ask, what kind of space is this? Uh, well, first of all, how do we uh, construct it in a more systematic way? So um, it turns out we can use something called total positivity. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at the totally non-negative part uh, of a complete flag variety, FLN. In this case, uh, it's the flag variety inside R3. Uh, and this is a construction that uh, dates back to Lustig in the 90s. Uh, and in fact, this geometric realization uh, is even nicer than what I was asking for. So not only do the vertices and edges correspond to vertices and edges over here, uh, all the d-dimensional faces in our space correspond to the intervals of length d in the poset. Okay. Um, we could also ask, what kind of space is this topologically? And uh, as it's depicted here, it's uh, definitely not a polytope. And in fact, you can check there's no way to turn it into a polytope while maintaining the combinatorics. Uh, nevertheless, I want to claim it's um, just as good as a polytope. And what I mean by that uh, is it's a space called a regular CW complex. Um, so a regular CW complex uh, is a space which satisfies um, these three properties. Um, so the first property is that um, uh, our, we can partition our space into faces, each of which is homeomorphic to an open ball. Uh, so here we have six vertices. Those are the zero dimensional faces. Uh, we have eight edges, uh, which are the one dimensional faces. We have uh, four two dimensional faces and one three dimensional face, which is the interior of this ball. Uh, the second property is that the boundary of every face is a union of faces of lower dimension. So there's a nice combinatorial structure to the boundary. And um, the last property is that the closure of every face is homeomorphic to a closed ball. So the topology of these faces is as trivial as possible. And uh, there's some uh, technical condition, which I'll just uh, leave on the slide. Um, okay, so what I wanna try to go over in my talk is first of all, um, what is uh, total positivity? How does it give us uh, spaces like these, which are related to Bruja orders? Um, uh, the second thing I wanna go over is uh, try to motivate uh, why regular CW complexes are interesting things to look at. And uh, finally, I want to discuss some new techniques we have 
for proving uh, that a space uh, is a regular CW complex. Uh, in particular, proving this third property, which in practice seems to be uh, the most challenging one, that uh, the closure of every cell is homeomorphic to a closed ball. And um, this totally non-negative part of the complete five variety is one instance of a space uh, that we now know is uh, a regular CW complex. Okay, um, now uh, there is a bit of a topology uh, in this talk. So um, let me just uh, give a quick uh, refresher uh, on a few terms. So uh, by an open ball, I just mean the set of points in Rn for some n, which are distance uh, strictly less than one from the origin. Uh, a closed ball is just the closure of that, the uh, points less than or equal to one. And uh, we're considering these spaces up to homeomorphism, and a homeomorphism is just a continuous function, uh, which is invertible, and its inverse is also continuous. Okay. Um, so, um, let me uh, introduce the Grassmannian GRKN, which is going to play the central role in this talk. Uh, so it's the set of k-dimensional subspaces of Rn. So here's a two-dimensional subspace of R4, um, which uh, we can think of as a two by four matrix. And um, the uh, rows of this matrix give a basis for our subspace. And of course, if we choose a different basis for a subspace, we'll get a different matrix. But it turns out all of these matrices are related uh, by row operations. Okay, but in any case, what we're gonna do is fix a matrix representative and use it to define some coordinates called Kluger coordinates, uh, labeled delta sub i, and they're gonna be given by taking determinants of submatrices of maximal size. So in this example, we have six Kluger coordinates. So delta one, two um, tells us to look in columns one and two, uh, and we take the determinant of that submatrix, which is one. Uh, delta one, three, uh, tells us to look in columns one and three, uh, and the determinant is three, and so on. Okay, and um, we call our point totally non-negative if we can find a matrix representative such that all these determinants are non-negative. So this is an example of an element of the totally non-negative part of GR24 uh, because all of its Kluger coordinates are positive. Um, though we would also allow uh, some Kluger coordinates to equal zero, which is how we get the boundary structure. Okay, and an um, uh, interesting special case is uh, when k equals one, then we're looking at um, subspaces of dimension one in Rn, which is projective space, Pn minus one, and it turns out that the totally non-negative part uh, is a simplex. So a kind of shorthand way to think of the totally non-negative Grassmannian uh, is that it is the notion of a simplex inside the Grassmannian. Okay. Um, so uh, let me talk about the cell decomposition of the totally non-negative Grassmannian. So uh, cell decomposition is just a way to partition our space into faces or cells, uh, which are homeomorphic to open balls. And uh, here it is for the totally non-negative part of GR13, which is P2. And what we get is a closed triangle. And um, uh, in general, uh, how we get our cells is, um, well, we take all our Kluger coordinates, so the six Kluger coordinates from the previous slide, uh, and we divide them into two pieces, and we require uh, the Kluger coordinates over here to be strictly positive, and we require the rest of the Kluger coordinates to equal zero. And we do that in all possible ways, and that cuts out our cell decomposition. And Postnikov uh, found a nice way to uh, describe the face poset of this decomposition. So here it is in this case. So what is the face poset? Uh, it's just a poset whose elements correspond to these faces. And uh, the closure relations tell us when one face is in the closure of another, uh, or rather the poset relations. So uh, for example, uh, this top element here corresponds to the interior of this triangle and the closure of this contains everything else. So that's why this element is above everything else in the poset. Um, these correspond to the three edges of the triangle. Uh, these correspond to the three vertices of the triangle. And this minimum here, we can think of as uh, being like the empty set. Okay. Uh, so now let me present uh, our results. So Postnikov uh, proved uh, several things about um, this decomposition. And um, he conjectured it forms a regular CW complex. And basically, 
uh, the thing he didn't prove was uh, this third property of the definition, which is that the closure of every face is homeomorphic to a closed ball. So uh, I'm not going to repeat the definition here, but let me just uh, cover an example of what can go wrong. So here are two different uh, cell decompositions of the same space, uh, a disk uh, or a two-dimensional closed ball. And this one on the left is not regular. And uh, the reason is because of this a one-dimensional cell here whose closure uh, is a circle. And a circle is not homeomorphic to a closed ball. Uh, in fact, it's not even contractible, uh, but we can fix this by adding a second vertex to our decomposition. Now we have two one-dimensional cells and the closure of each is homeomorphic uh, to a one-dimensional closed ball. It's a closed line segment. Okay, so some previous work uh, in this area. Uh, the Lustig showed that the totally non-negative Grassmannian is contractible. Um, uh, Lauren Williams proved that uh, the face poset from the previous slide is graded thin and shellable. Um, I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a couple of slides. And uh, let me also mention that this is uh, one of the ingredients that goes into our proof. Uh, Postnikoff, Spire, and Williams proved that uh, the totally non-negative Grassmannian is a CW complex. Reach and Williams uh, prove this conjecture up to homotopy. So in particular, the closure of every cell is contractible. Uh, in previous work, we proved the whole space is homeomorphic to a closed ball. And uh, the result I'm presenting today is that we've proved the conjecture now in full. And uh, everything on this slide uh, has a generalization if we replace the Grassmannian with an arbitrary partial flag variety G mod P. Uh, and in that case, our result is proving a conjecture of Williams. Okay, um, so uh, for this talk, I'm gonna focus mainly on the Grassmannian, but I just wanna um, go through uh, another uh, interesting instance of a, a partial flag variety, which is the complete flag variety FLN, uh, which I alluded to at the beginning of this talk. So um, that's just the set of uh, tuples of subspaces in RN uh, of all possible dimensions with one contained in the next. And uh, its totally non-negative part was defined by Lustig uh, in the 90s, actually uh, for any uh, partial flag variety. Uh, but in this case, uh, what it is is, um, well, uh, each uh, subspace is contained in some Grassmannian and we just require it's contained in the totally non-negative part of its Grassmannian. And it has a nice cell decomposition. This was conjectured by Lustig and uh, proved by Reach. And the cell decomposition is just uh, indexed by the intervals in the strong Bruja order. So this is the analog, the geometric realization of the strong uh, Bruja order uh, from the beginning of my talk. And here are a couple of pictures of it and kind of more natural coordinates. And um, it follows from our general result that this space uh, is indeed a regular CW complex. Okay. So um, that's our result. Now let me try to give some motivation. Why should we be interested in knowing these kinds of spaces are regular CW complexes? Well, um, I claimed earlier that um, a regular CW complex is just as good as a convex polytope. So uh, let me try to justify that. So first of all, every convex polytope is a regular CW complex. We just have to um, decompose it into its open faces. And Buerner observed that regular CW complexes are combinatorial objects um, in the sense that um, they're uniquely determined up to homeomorphism by their face poset. And the reason that is, is basically that uh, one way to define a regular CW complex is by recursively uh, gluing on uh, closed balls onto an existing space. And the face poset tells us uniquely how to do that gluing. And uh, conversely, he observed that there are certain nice conditions on a post set, namely being graded thin and shellable, uh, which imply that we can do this gluing procedure. And um, these are the properties that Williams proved about uh, the face post set of the toy non-negative Grassmannian. And moreover, there are uh, natural post sets, um, such as the strong Bruja order on the symmetric group, which was shown to be shellable by Edelman, um, which um, therefore, come from some regular CW complex, but they don't come from a polytope. So this suggests looking beyond the world of polytopes. So um, we've seen this post set before, but now um, we're gonna think about it a bit differently. So these elements 
uh, no longer correspond to vertices of a space, they correspond to the faces of our space. And um, these are the closure relations. So um, this bottom element corresponds to the empty set, so we can ignore it. This top element corresponds to a two-dimensional face, and we also want to have uh, two edges and two vertices. And it's just not possible to have a polytope with two edges and two vertices. Okay, uh, but nevertheless, um, there is a regular CW complex, um, which we can construct via this gluing procedure. Now, Bjorner asked, well, this uh, gluing procedure is kind of artificial. This is a naturally occurring postset in mathematics. Shouldn't there be a naturally occurring space, which has um, this postset as its base postset? And uh, at the time, nobody knew the answer because uh, this was in the 80s before Lustig's work on total positivity. And after that work, uh, Femin and Shapira realized how to answer um, Birner's question. And I'll just tell you what their answer is in this case. Um, so we're gonna look at a space of three by three matrices, which are upper triangular and have ones on the diagonal. So these are called uh, unipotent matrices. And we have a total non-negativity condition, which is that um, every square submatrix of any size has a non-negative determinant. Uh, and um, we have one more condition, which is that the entries immediately above the diagonal, here A and C, add up to one. Um, and that's called taking the link of the identity. That's just to make our space be compact. And you can actually plot what this space is. It's two-dimensional. And we indeed get a space with two vertices and two edges. Okay, so Famine and Shapira define this space. Um, they showed it has the right uh, face post set and they conjectured it's a regular CW complex and their conjecture was later proved by Hirsch. And uh, let me say, so uh, Femin and Shapira outlined some uh, strategy for proving their conjecture, uh, which didn't quite succeed. And uh, Hirsch gave a completely different argument. And um, we give a new proof of Hirsch's theorem, kind of completing the argument of Femin and Shapira and also generalizing it to the Grassmannian. Okay. So that's kind of the historical motivation, uh, which was ultimately the motivation for Postnikov to make that conjecture. Um, and, but there's also some uh, new motivation coming uh, from the past few years from work in physics. And this comes from a phenomenon of associating uh, a differential form uniquely to a geometric space. So without going into too many details, let me say you can do this for any polytope, you get a differential form. Uh, you can do this also for any cluster variety, like the Grassmannian, you'll get a differential form. Uh, and it turns out in certain cases, this differential form is an interesting function in physics. So um, one case of that is uh, for the amplitudehedron. This is a space which is a generalization of the totally non-negative Grassmannian. Uh, it has uh, one of these forms, and this form is um, a scattering amplitude. And um, the intuition that we get from physics is that um, this form uh, is closely related to the combinatorics and geometry of this space. So uh, if we can understand the space better, uh, this could tell us new things about the form and therefore uh, new things in physics. And that was actually our motivation. So these amplitudehedra are projections of the totally non-negative Grassmannian. And so if we wanna understand amplitudehedra better, first we wanted to understand uh, the totally non-negative Grassmannian better. And let me just say that this is kind of a more widespread phenomenon. There are other spaces uh, which come up, uh, including associahedra, and this is related to the work which Vincent Pilot spoke about. Okay, um, that's some uh, motivation. Now let me uh, give an outline of our proof. So let's remember what we're trying to prove. We have um, X, which is the closure of a cell in the totally non-negative Grassmannian. We want to show it's homeomorphic to a closed ball. And we're going to use some uh, deep results from topology. So the generalized Poincaré conjecture, uh, which tell us that um, it suffices to check these several properties about X. And it turns out that the property uh, we need to be concerned with uh, is this one being a topological manifold with boundary at the boundary. Uh, so basically what that means is if we have a point y at the boundary of x, then if I look uh, locally around y, it looks like y is sitting on a hyperplane in Euclidean space and x is on one side. 
Um, and it turns out that these other properties uh, follow by induction uh, using the previous results uh, I mentioned earlier. And uh, our strategy uh, is going to follow an idea of Thameen and Shapira, which involves looking at links. So what is a link? We have our point Y on the boundary of X. Uh, we're just going to take a small sphere centered at Y and intersect it with X. And that's going to give us the link. And um, we want to know that uh, this space really looks like uh, a half space. So to do that, we're just going to check these two properties. So the first property uh, is that this link itself is homeomorphic to a closed ball. And the second is that um, locally around here, um, the picture looks like the cone over the link. So here we have this link, which is a closed ball. Here we have the cone over a closed ball. Um, and a cone over a closed ball looks like a half space. So then we're done. So how do we prove these properties one and two? Well, let's focus on property one. We want to prove this link is homeomorphic to a closed ball. Well, that's similar to what we're originally trying to prove. So we could repeat this whole argument, but that's going to involve taking a link inside this link. And um, we don't want to keep on going taking links indefinitely. So it turns out that if we're clever in defining our links, um, then the link inside a link will be another link and kind of the argument will fold in on itself. So how we want to define these links uh, is by letting uh, big Y be the cell containing little y. That's going to be some cell in the boundary of X. And then we'll define the link of the cell Y inside the cell X. And there are uh, analogs of these properties one and two. Okay, so how are we going to get this link of the cell Y inside the cell X? Uh, well, we need two maps. So the first uh, is a projection map. So here's our big cell X. Here's our smaller cell Y contained in the boundary of X. Here it's an edge. And um, we just want a projection map. And uh, what we're going to do is just take a point little Y inside Y and look at its fiber. So look at all the points which project down to it. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing as before, take a small sphere centered at Y, but now we're going to intersect it with the fiber. And that's going to give us the link of the cell Y inside the cell X. Now this appears to depend upon a choice of little y. So if we chose a different point little y, we get a different definition of the link and we want these two definitions to be homeomorphic. So we also want translation maps which translate between these fibers. Okay, that allows us to define the link but we also need to get this property too which was the structure of the cone over the link. And for that what we want are um, dilation actions on our fibers, which kind of move up and down the fiber. Okay, so how are we gonna get these three maps? Uh, well, Thameen and Shapira constructed the first two kinds of maps in the case of the unipotent group. Um, that was the case they were looking at and made their conjecture about. Um, and uh, let me show you their construction uh, just through an example. So say we wanna project from this cell to the cell where this entry in the corner is zero. Um, then there's some combinatorial rule going back to Kajdan and Lustig, which tells us we can factor our matrix uniquely as a product of two matrices, one where this entry is zero and the second one where these two entries are zero. And then the projection is just gonna be the first term in this factorization. And uh, there's a similar description of these uh, translation maps. Okay, so this still leaves us with a couple of issues. So first of all, how do we define uh, these dilation actions, which move up and down the fibers? Uh, and this was kind of the main uh, missing piece uh, that Femin and Shapira didn't have. And um, the second point is, how do we construct these maps for the Grassmannian? Now, the Grassmannian is a space of matrices, but it doesn't really make sense to multiply these matrices. So how are we gonna get an analog of matrix multiplication on the Grassmannian? And it turns out the answer to both of these issues um, is to embed our Grassmannian inside an even bigger flag variety. And this embedding is due to Snyder. So let me just show you what it is in the case of GR24. So here we take our element of GR24 and we're gonna embed it inside an affine flag variety, uh, which we can think of as like the usual flag variety, but now we have uh, infinite matrices, which, which are periodic. Okay, and it turns out that these infinite periodic matrices behave 
enough like unipotent matrices that we can do this matrix factorization. And, and this was kind of uh, explored uh, for a different reason in the case of the usual flag variety by Knudsen, Wu, and Yaw. And uh, so this allows us uh, to define the projection and translation maps. How do we get these dilation actions? Um, well, remember, our the definition of the link depended on a choice of point, la little y. And it turns out that there's um, a special point little y where it's very natural to define these dilation actions. But we don't see this point y in the grass monument. We only see it uh, in, the in the affine flag variety after we embed. OK, so uh, that's our proof. And um, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Stephen. And, uh... Now we are uh, going to uh, the question session, which is handled by Amy Park. So, uh, maybe minutes. Paul, uh, four minutes. Yeah. So, uh, Bishop Deb uh, asks uh, Is it possible to find the basis for a k dimensional subspace? So, um, that has it. K minus non negative, so, so a positive, I think a positive cross money. And can you find one such that the resulting matrix has all its minus non negative, not just the K minus? Oh, yeah, that's an uh, interesting question. I, I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Gabriel Frieden asks, uh, what is the analog of the affine flag variety if you're doing this for general uh, GOV? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, uh, still in, it's always an affine flag variety, um, just of the same uh, like Lee type as the original uh, G mod P. Okay, um, any other questions? Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess if, um, people don't have questions for now, so, but there is, you can always ask questions uh, via the Slack afterwards. So I'm going to pass it back to Eli now.